Amen. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. And welcome to worship, church. Welcome to this place and this space and time of worship together, both in person, online, and with the whole church invisible and visible. It is good to gather in worship this morning. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we are so very glad that you are here. We hope that you will feel at home at Amity. I want to draw your attention to some things happening on the back of the bulletin. You'll see a little bit about what's going on in the life of the church. There's so much more that won't fit on one bulletin page, but here's what we are asking you to notice today. Um, first, I will be away next week um, on study leave. And so we, uh, you all have the gift of hosting a guest preacher. Her name is Nicole Thompson. And she is an elder over at the Grove Presbyterian Church. She's been preaching in all kinds of denominations for over 20 years. She works um, with Mecklenburg County in their Department of Social Services. She is a gift. And so I, I hope that you will welcome her warmly as you do. Um, enjoy that gift next Sunday. Uh, let's see, there's a couple things. I want to invite you to participate in, and one of those, Sarah Simmons, our intern from Union Seminary, um, she has been with us since September, and if you are only here on Sundays, you have probably only seen her twice when she preached, because she works in another church, but she is a regular face at Amity on Wednesdays with our food ministry and Project Harmony. Her last Sunday with us is March 26th already. Um, it's our hope to give her a love gift because she has been serving with us out of the desire of her heart to be here. Um, so if you would like to contribute to that so that we can send her with a gift and a blessing, um, please get those gifts into the church. Um, and you can send them to the church, into the office. Make your checks out to Amity so that we can write her a check for those gifts. Please give freely and joyfully to that. Um, and you'll also see one other thing where you're invited to give, if you have it, is planters <laughs> for the um, community garden. The food justice team is collecting large planters. If you've got any at home, we're going to start a wildflower or a bee, not wildflower, pollinator garden to help our community garden. Bees and butterflies, hummingbirds, all those things that will help our vegetables grow. Um, so we're doing it in containers, so if you have any of those laying around at home that you don't need anymore or that you're willing to part with, please bring them to the church. Yes? That is a good thought, Barbara said. If, if you got yard sales going on in your neighborhood, stop by and take a look and see if anybody's selling any planters like that. It's a great place to find them. All right. Please take note of the prayer needs in your bulletin. Um, I want to make sure everybody is Tom is home, right? Is there any other update? We praise God. Tom was in the hospital this week, and so we are praising God that he is home and recovering. Um, keep them in your prayer team, Barbara, as well, as well as all these folks here on your prayer list. We'll pray for them today and throughout the week. All right, friends, we will begin worship with our gathering song that we will sing. You're invited to stay seated. After we sing that song, we'll move right into our breath prayer. Continuing in our Lenten practice of breath prayers. Today, especially, 
we will need to anchor ourselves in our bodies. Our bodies are where we feel our deepest emotions. And that is because we are people made to feel. So as we enter worship, you have permission to feel whatever emotions come up for you today, the comforting ones and the challenging ones, sit with them, befriend them. I invite you to close your eyes and breathe. I will not become numb. I am made to feel. I will not become numb. I am made to feel. I will not become numb. I am made to feel. <sighs> Siblings, come. Rise. Sing to the one who made you and calls you their own. Hymn 356. Come now, fount of every blessing. Beloveds, <clears throat> we can come to God with the truth of our lives, the fullness of our lives, all that we don't hesitate to share, and all that we would rather keep hidden. With God, we are known, we are seen fully, and we are forgiven and we are loved. So we come to God with openness and honesty, sharing the truth of our lives and our hearts. So this morning, as we begin our prayer of confession, we will begin in silence, and then we will pray our responsive prayer of confession in your bulletin. So church, trusting in God's love, let us begin with silent prayer.
And now praying responsively with our voices, God of mercy and love, we confess our apathy toward what should make us angry. We see poverty all around us, yet we choose to turn our heads. We hear about the tragedies of gun violence, yet we choose to close our eyes. We know there is a mental health crisis, yet we choose to ignore it. We see children suffering, and we accept it as just the way things are. God, make us mad. Forgive our apathy. Move us to action. And make us whole again. Amen. Beloveds, God's forgiveness does not end with our receiving it. It stirs us to just action, to just living, to new life not just for ourselves, but for the whole world. Christ is for us. God is for us, and nothing can separate us or anyone else from that love. Know the truth of God's love. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. We'll sing of that good news, sing Jesus Loves Me as children come to the front. had this conversation conversation before. Let's think a little bit this morning about anger. Have you ever been angry? <laughs> yes. Have you all ever been angry? Yes. yes, right? Everybody who's a person has been angry. Sometimes we get angry and what do you hear from the grown-ups around you? Go to your room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we hear that, right? You, like you kind of get in trouble. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot, and grown-ups tell this to each other too. We say, don't be angry. Calm down. Don't, you, don't act like that. Don't respond that way, right? Calm down. We, we learn to take deep breaths before we respond. We learn to take time before we respond when we get mad, because sometimes what happens when we respond when we're mad? We make bad choices. Mm -hmm. Anger is a powerful thing, right? It is. But anger itself is not bad. Did you know that? It's not. It's a feeling. And feelings that we have, they can't be bad. They're just feelings. Right? Do you know that even Jesus got angry? Mm-hmm. Even Jesus got angry, and our scripture story for today is about a time that Jesus got angry. Do you know this story? Not sure? Yeah? All right. Yeah. Evie knows this story. It's the story of how Jesus went to where? To, in the where? In the temple. Yeah, he, Jesus went to the temple, and when he got there, the temple is what? It's a place of... Worship, right? Just like our church is a place of worship. But this was a very, very special temple. And lots of people would travel to the temple to worship God and to offer sacrifices and to ask for forgiveness. That was the tradition of the, of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Animals, yeah, yeah, that was part of it. Doves and different, yeah, that's sacrifices. We don't do that, right? Um, 
But there are a lot of cultures and religions where that was especially the practice. Things have changed in some places and with some religions, but this was part of the practice when Jesus was alive, okay? And, <laughs> and um, so Jesus went to the temple, and he noticed that in the courts of the temple, there were powerful people who were charging people money to purchase animal sacrifices so that they could be forgiven. So if you didn't have any money, or if you didn't have much money, you didn't have enough, you couldn't ask God for forgiveness in the way that they did that, right? We don't believe that anymore, right? But then that is what was happening, and the money changers were there. Money changers were oh, people who you had, to, you had to offer your money in the right type of money. So people were coming from all over the world. And they had to change their money out, and they were charging them extra. And Jesus came in to the temple, a place of worship, and he saw this, and he got mad. Yeah, he did what? He flipped the tables of the money changers. Not just like, hey, you guys, stop it. He took it, and he flipped the table over, and the coins went scattering everywhere, and everyone probably went, ooh. I don't know. He flipped the tables over, and he told the money changers to get out. He cast them out of the temple, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Maybe, maybe. Um, But he said, this is a house of prayer. My father's house is a house of prayer, and you have turned it into a den of thieves. You are stealing from the people that God loves. So he was mad. Do you think it was okay that Jesus got mad? Yeah. Because why? Why was that okay? He didn't get mad, really. We don't see much anger in Jesus. Hmm? Because it was for a good reason. Mm Mm-hmm. Hmm? It was about, there's a a word um, that we use, it was just. It was about justice. Jesus saw injustice. He saw something that was wrong in the world, in, the, in um, their religion, in the faith that the people were doing, and he recognized it as wrong. And so he got angry, and it made people look and see. Did he hurt anybody in it, with his anger? We don't think so, no. He flipped the tables, right? He flipped the tables, he told the truth, he said, this is wrong. This, this is what you're doing, and this is wrong, and you've got to go, right? He told the truth. He got angry at what was wrong, not to hurt the people. So there's things that you see that are wrong in the world, right? <laughs> Can you flip a table? <laughs> Evie wants to flip a table. Not in here. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. All right. Um, what something, name something that you see that's wrong in the world. Mm-hmm. What? Mm-hmm. Homophobia. Okay. That hurts people, doesn't it? What? What's your what? Ooh, child labor. Davy's been thinking. Yeah. What else? What else do you see? Racism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ooh, people without homes. Yep. What else? Ooh, gun violence, okay. People against what? Women's rights. All right. I promise these aren't plants. (laughs) People against women's rights, yeah. When we see these things, It makes us feel lots of things. It makes us sad, right? It makes us frustrated and it makes us mad because people are hurt. And there's so many more things we could put on there. So I'm going to give you this one, okay? And I'm going to give you this one, okay? And what I want you to do, we're going to make, we're going to pray with some anger. You think God's okay with that? 
You could scream if you want. <laughs> sometimes people scream out of their anger. Sometimes they scream at God when they're mad and they don't understand something. Sometimes they shout at others or they shout the truth, right? So I want you to look at what's on your paper. I'm going to imagine some things that are on mine, okay? And we're going to say, God, these things are not okay. And we're going to rip them up. Yeah, do it again. Rip it again. That's okay, rip it again. Yeah, okay? These things are not okay. <laughs> and that was kind of <clears throat> a silly little expression. Rip it up. Rip it up. <laughs> Rip it up. We can ask God to help us, even through our anger, to make the world a better place and look more like God wants it to look like which is where everyone is welcome, everyone is safe, and everyone is cared for, right? It's okay, all right? We're going to talk about more about rage and anger today and how we use it in healthy ways and how it can also be a dangerous thing, right? So we have to be careful with it, okay? So when you feel mad at something going on in the world, I want you to take that to God, okay? And say, God, this is making me mad. I don't understand this. Let's make it better. Help me make it better, okay? So let's pray real quick. <laughs> Dear God, thank you so much for making me to feel joy, hope, sadness, even anger. Turn it into good. Amen. So you want to pile that on here. And you guys, when you go back to the playground, if you're headed back there, I'd love for you to draw pictures. Davey, come on. Draw pictures or write prayers, okay, about what makes you angry and what you want God to change in the world, okay? All right, you can go on back. I want to invite a couple folks forward to share about two ministry teams in our church, about the administrative team and the finance team. Those are ministry teams that um, are ways that we embody the faith that we have, the way that we live them out in the life of this church and in our community. So um, they are going to share a little bit briefly about those two ministry teams, you can come on up, Cheryl, and consider, ask God to show you where you can serve and embody your faith. <laughs> Good morning. According to our mission statement, the ministry team is responsible for the general administrative demands placed upon the church, the church office and its staff. We work with Pastor Megan to provide support for the staff to help ensure efficient and effective operation of the church office. We develop and maintain job descriptions for all staff members including an annual evaluation of their performance. We evaluate the use, the effectiveness, and the needs of the church office equipment and software and make changes or recommendations to the session. Amity is so fortunate to have an outstanding and hardworking staff who are professional, knowledgeable, and enthusiastic. If you become a member of the administration team, you can join us in cake and camaraderie <laughs> as we celebrate each staff member on his or her birthday. We also participate in two missions to collect school supplies for Winterfield Elementary School and work with the ambassador editor, Beverly Randall, to provide support 
in the publication of the ambassador. Come and join us as we continue to rejoice in the opportunity to serve as a vital part of the mission of Amity Presbyterian Church. Thanks. Amen. I say finance has one goal. <laughs> We're to keep the doors open and the lights on <laughs> so that everybody else can do all the work. <laughs> says as part of that goal, we oversee all the income and expenses and hopefully try to keep it in line. Um, we count all the monies that are contributed with the exception of the online money. That's handled strictly by the financial secretary as she gets the reports from the bank at the end of the month and posts the money to everybody's accounts <laughs> and onto the financial reports where it needs to be. Um, we're also responsible for putting together the budget after all of the teams have presented their hopes to us for the coming year. Um, we try to put it all together for approval by the session and then presentation to the congregation at the congregational meeting. It says that pre I'm looking for somebody to help me. Right now it's just me and Bill. Mm -hmm. Bill's health is not good. And I don't want to be the only one telling y'all we need more money. <laughs> so if anybody would like to help, please see me after church mm -hmm. so we can work out a time to get together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. We thank God and praise God for the gifts of our team leaders who serve faithfully. You are invited to serve and steward the gifts that God has given. Ask God to show you where you should serve. Our first scripture reading is Psalm 13. Listen for God's word to us today. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. And from that psalm of lament, we turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 12 to 22. Listen for God's word to us again. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. And early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. And then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the tree withered. 
When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. This is the word of God, and it is for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Something you may not know about me is that I love watching TV shows about people's experiences with the paranormal. I don't mean Hollywood horror movies either. I mean the the kind of shows where they have the real interviews with the real people who tell their stories of their encounters with the paranormal, with ghosts or spirits who turn their homes and their lives upside down. Whether or not one believes in that sort of thing, the trauma on these, that these people have experienced is real. And their fear can clearly be seen on their faces as they tell these stories in a show about angry and dangerous ghosts. The humans are the most haunting part. But almost always in shows like these, there are these really bad (laughs) reenactments. These retellings of the ghost encounters. They're poorly acted and they usually have terrible low budget special effects Usually they just make your, you roll your eyes, but every once in a while, one will be just creepy enough to give you goosebumps or make you jump when you least expect it. And in almost every story of someone's haunted home, the people start calling in the experts for help. There's usually a priest who shows up with prayers and holy water to bless the home. There's the paranormal investigator team that comes with their cameras and their gadgets, or there's a psychic that comes, or there's usually some spiritual person who shows up with a bundle of sage. And this person lights the bundle of sage so that it begins to release its fragrant curls of smoke, and they carry this smoky sage throughout the house, throughout each room, determined to cleanse the home of any evil. Sometimes this cleansing works, and sometimes it doesn't seem to. But when today's gospel story comes up, and it's referred to by its common descriptor, the cleansing of the temple. This is the image that comes to my mind first. I picture Jesus, bundle of smoky sage in hand, walking through the temple, calmly telling those who mean harm that they are no longer welcome there. (laughs) Right? I mean, the cleansing of the temple. It's such a nice, polite, sanitized description of this story, isn't it? Maybe if the first place your imagination goes is not to paranormal TV shows like mine, you might imagine a scene that includes Jesus and the disciples pushing brooms and mops, dusting the cobwebs out of the corners of the temple on on their annual temple cleanup day. We've got one of those coming up here, just for the record, on the last Saturday of the month. Maybe we should think about renaming it. (laughs) You'll get more information about that. But the gospel passage, it surprises us because there's nothing nice or polite or calm about this story. In the cleansing of the temple, we don't find the non-threatening, divinely gentle, composed Jesus of the photos on our childhood Sunday school classrooms. We meet loose cannon. Jesus. A seemingly very human Jesus. Jesus literally flipping tables. 
sending coins, flying, shouting at people, at the money changers, and those selling animals, yelling at them to get out. In John's gospel account of this story, not the one we read today, but Jesus makes a whip out of cords and uses it to drive out all the sacrificial animals from the temple. In his anger, he seems to shout scripture. It is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And if that's not startling enough for us, the gospel tells us that the next morning, Jesus wakes up hungry. Not just hungry, he wakes up hangry. (laughs) You know that word? Hungry and angry. It's that special kind of angry you get when you need something to eat right? Hangry. He sees a fig tree, but upon realizing that it doesn't actually have any figs on it for him to eat, he curses it, causing it to immediately shrink back and wither right then and there. In yesterday's bout of anger in the temple and in this morning's hunger, we might be tempted to speak more of Jesus' human nature, but in this encounter with the fig tree, we are startled back into an awareness of his godly power. Because I know I can get angry, I can throw things, but my words alone have never caused a tree to wither and die right in front of my eyes. Our words can certainly cause people to wither and shrink. I've never seen it happen to a tree. The Jesus we meet in these passages of Scripture is a God of holy, premeditated, bodily, unapologetic rage. We don't like that word, do we? Rage. We don't like it in ourselves. It frightens us in others. And we feel especially uncomfortable witnessing it in Jesus. Take a minute this morning and consider what the word rage means for you. Because you are carrying its meaning with you. As Cole Arthur Riley, the author of our Lenten series book, reminds us, We carry our stories in our bodies. They live there, along with the image of God. So where rage has entered our stories, where rage has entered your life, your story, perhaps through someone else in your life, or even if you are the channel of rage, your body, will tell that story somehow. It will. So I'm going to invite you to listen to your own body for a minute, trusting that you are safe here, trusting that you, since you are deep enough to hold the image of God within you. You can hold all the depth of your story, even when it feels too big. Trusting, church, that you cannot lose God's love, I invite you to close your eyes. And you can, you can open them if you need to at any time, but I invite you to close your eyes and notice first how your body feels right now. Your hands, your pulse, how your muscles tense or relax. Keep noticing those things as you listen. Where do you find rage in your story?
Maybe rage for you has a specific name, a particular face. And so for you, rage feels unsafe and frightening. You are safe here. Maybe, maybe you personally know the feeling of rage that rises up and then explodes. And you've seen it hurt others. So for you, rage feels more like shame. You are still loved. Maybe rage has been your constant companion in life, living just below the surface because you've never felt truly seen or known or safe or valued. You contain the glory of God. Even your anger is sacred. Maybe you have painstakingly worked to lock your rage up behind the bank vault of your fear. So you've convinced yourself it doesn't exist in you at all, that there's no need for it. Remember, when God made you human, God made you to feel and to feel deeply. So breathe deeply, beloveds. I will not become numb. I am made to feel. I am deep enough to hold my feelings. I am made to feel. Open your eyes when you're ready. You are still here. You are safe. You are whole. Rage, anger, it is a part of our stories because it's a part of our humanity. And perhaps, it's a part of our humanity because, church, because perhaps it is a part of God. We like to put it outside of that image of God, right? Because how could something that is, has proven to be so wild and unruly and dangerous, how could that come from God? My friends, how could it not? There is such power in our capacity for anger that it can terrify us. I wonder if this is what Jesus was getting at. When he responded, when he responds to his disciples' question as they stand there slack-jawed and eyes wide at their friend and their Lord who has just killed an entire fig tree with his curse words. <laughs> and he says, you don't realize it, but you could do this too. You could do more if you really wanted to, if you really believed you could. You could cast mountains into the sea if you ask God for it in prayer. Sometimes our anger is our prayer. The psalmists, they knew this very well. So we know the power of our anger and our rage. We do. We know it. But what do we do with it? 
If we are tasked with wielding something so powerful, we must examine it, church. We must know our rage. We must know where it comes from and where to direct it. Because church, unexamined, unacknowledged rage and anger, it will begin to exercise its power over us. When we refuse to see how rage is operating in our stories, in our bodies, in our lives, in our communities, it will naturally join with its close cousin, fear. And when rage joins with fear or finds its identity in fear, it becomes hate. And that hate, it might come spilling out of us onto whoever we think deserves it. Or it might turn inward, putting down roots putting roots down inside of us, stealing our ability to see and believe our own belovedness and beauty. Because hate, church, hate doesn't care where it's directed just as long as someone feels it. That kind of rage has one goal, and that is to dominate, to control. That kind of rage only serves itself. But there's another kind of rage. One that we do not need to fear if we pay attention and if we treat it with care. It's the one that we witness here in Jesus in the gospel story. And, and that kind of rage is a rage that liberates Rage that frees, anger that is born out of concern for the other, and out of an unwavering belief that the brokenness that we witness in the world is not the way that it should be, and out of a courageous hope that this is not the way that it will be. This is the rage we might feel when children die or go hungry when so much food is wasted. We might feel this rage when our elders aren't cared for or don't feel safe, when systems of racism steal belovedness from children of God, when things, systems like white supremacy, when they make, when they make white men feel like their only two choices for expressing emotion are disconnection or violence. There's so much more. Those same systems, they make sure that beautiful brown-skinned children of every shade question their worth before they even leave elementary school. It's the kind of rage at those systems. It's the kind of rage that we might feel when we see preventable chemical disasters destroy cities, livelihoods, lives, creation. <laughs> or when the well-being of communities are neglected in favor of profits. I'm sure you can add to your own list we rage at these things because we know that it's not supposed to be like this. And we know that it doesn't have to be. We long for creation to be liberated from those chains. Unexamined rage might join with fear to become hate that consumes and destroys. But when our rage invites hope, to become its partner, church, it gives birth to justice. Justice that repents, justice that redeems, justice that restores. Jesus isn't angry because they weren't doing things in the temple the way he liked. 
He's angry. Because the very ones meant to be the bearers of belonging in the world, they are excluding and exploiting the vulnerable. The temple, the place to encounter the divine, has become a place of scarcity, emptied of the ones who need it. And witnessing this inspires an outpouring of loving, holy rage from the very heart of God. I love how Arthur Riley puts it when she says, it's easy to make it more about what was happening in the temple instead of what was happening in the body of Christ. What does it mean that Christ doesn't just scream, but he physically overturns tables? What does it mean that Christ doesn't just lament the bare fig tree, but he damns it, leaving his followers with gaping mouths and no immediate resolution? What does that mean? One of the reasons expressions of rage are so powerful, church, is that they always invoke a response in those who witness them. Always. That's why when it comes to injustice, to responses to injustice, we must use those expressions carefully, hopefully examining our rage in prayer with God and in dialogue with others. Expressions of rage and lament, they are chances, as Jesus took here, to draw others to witness the painful truth. To say, I won't look, let you look away from my pain or this pain until you decide how you will respond. You may not have noticed the one little verse in the gospel passage. It says, when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw this, when they see this, Jesus' outburst and how the people still come to him to be healed and the children still sing his praises, they are indignant. That's anger, church. They are resentful. How dare he come here? And act like that. And still, still receive praise and be an agent of healing in a way that we can't. His rage invokes a response in them, but because his truth-telling draws everyone's eyes to their sin and the injustices that they are allowing to happen, they fall back into their fear and their defensiveness. Their anger is the kind that seeks to dominate and control and overpower. They can't handle Jesus' expression of rage and lament because it shakes the fragile foundations of their worldly identity, which they believe rests on their maintaining of power. They are afraid. They are afraid. They can't receive Christ's rage for the gift that it is to them too. If they would allow Jesus to show them the truth of their injustice right before them, if they could be willing to look and to see the humanity of the ones they are exploiting, they could be set free from their own bondage, their own bondage to power and control. Their hardened hearts could be brought to life through grace, love, and restorative justice. We, church, we would do well to ask God for the courage to accept that same invitation when someone's expression of righteous rage exposes our own acts of injustice and harm. It can be a gift of immeasurable worth, one that we are called to receive at times, and one that we have the power to give. I want you to hear these closing words, brief words from Cole Arthur Riley herself who from her complex, painful, 
beautiful story as a black woman in America and all the challenge that that brings. She calls us into a deeper knowing of our rage. Listen to her words. I'm not convinced that we can tell the truth alienated from the truth of our emotion. They're necessary company. Sometimes, however threatening it may be, it is seeing the face of anger that can finally shake a people out of their numbness, out of their inner death. I've determined that I will no longer settle for mere articulation of anger. I want to feel my voice shake and the warmth creep up my spine. So I pray that you scream. May a harsh blood beat through every limb with a sound loud enough to shatter glass. Poke the beast. Burn it down. Do not smile for them. They who destroy and use anger to dominate, they deserve nothing from you. Look them in their scared eyes and tell the truth with the passion it demands. Beloveds, rage is powerful. We all wield it. May we seek God, and may God give us the courage to see the truth, to receive the gift of others' rage at injustice, and the gift of becoming truth-tellers. Alleluia. Amen. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, My heart is very sorrowful. Sit here while I go and pray. And going a little farther into the garden, he fell to his knees and prayed, My father, if it is possible, take this cup away from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Jesus went into the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. He went there sad and very weary, to be alone to pray. Oh,
beloveds. When we pray, we can give our anger to God. It is a form of prayer. And when we had our Ash Wednesday prayer stations or prayer time in the sanctuary, one of our prayer stations was about rage. The things that break our hearts to the point of anger and outcry. And so I'm going to lift up some of these during our prayers of the people. It's going to be a simple prayer where we name these things before God and then in the silence, name your own. You can speak them aloud or in silence, but name your holy rage. Let us pray. Holy God, we are angry. We rage and we hope and we hope and we rage. We confess that we cannot even comprehend all the injustice in the world. Sometimes our anger wearies us. Help us to know what we should do with it, God. Hear these things that break our hearts, that make us cry, how long, O oh Lord, and enrage us with the weight of it all. For children dying from gun violence, war, poverty, senseless violence, cycles of abuse and violence, apathy in the middle of it all, cancer, especially of children, you, the war in Ukraine, natural disasters, the difficulty of aging, loneliness, people not caring for others, the world being turned into a den of robbers. How unfair life seems to be for scarcity mindsets and distribution problems, for war, for sexual and gender-based violence, ignoring the wounds and the hurts of others, poverty, food, insecurity, families not church, not knowing God, parents neglecting children. Hmm, not getting what I want. The neglect of children and the neglect of the elderly. Lord, hear our rage. Lord, we trust that you know what to do with all of this. Give us the courage to be truth-tellers. Give us the courage to be truth-hearers. Move us into compassion, change, healing, justice. Hear your people, God, as we pray together the prayer that Jesus gave us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
1 Peter 4, 10 to 11. Like good stewards of the manifold of grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And I ask um, that as we go through this Lenten season, you're hearing about the different ministries that are going on in this church. That is a place to take your passion and move forward, both with your talents to be good stewards of the place we've been given and the community that we can reach. I ask that you look in your heart and see whether you can give in body or in financial ways. You can give online through our church website, possibly through your investment portfolio. <laughs> you could leave a legacy, a gift through your estate, or simply in the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary as you leave. No matter how much you give, give it with joy and trust in our God who will take that and multiply it and who loves us so much. People of God, let us rise and sing our clo closing song of praise, hymn 446, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. All of your emotions are sacred. God holds them all, and God longs to bring restoration through you in this world as we rest in the love and the grace of Jesus, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, which goes with you each and every day. Let's sing ourselves home.